Good morning, everyone. And welcome to our worship. Welcome to those of you who will be joining us online later in the day. Uh, We're here to worship God, to give thanks, to celebrate God's presence with us, to offer our lives in Christ's service. So we pause just for a moment. In the midst of the the hustle and bustle of a busy week, we recognise that God has been with us every moment and that God is with us here and now. So let's decide that we will worship God with our hearts, mind, soul and strength. As we sing together, I'll worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Loving God, we come to worship you. And we acknowledge that we are in the presence of the Holy One. We come before you with a sense of awe and a sense of wonder. We come before you in response to all that we've seen of your beauty and your glory in the world around us. We worship in response to all that we have experienced of your love and your grace. In the midst of our joys and our sorrows, in the midst of all our relationships, We have experienced you in the actions and words of family and friends and strangers. 
But most of all, you reveal your love and your grace to us in Jesus Christ. And so humbly we come to say that we love you and we want to love you more. And we come as disciples who want to grow in our following of Jesus. But aware of the ways that we have fallen short. So we say that we're sorry. We're sorry for the times when we have chosen our own selfish way. We're sorry for the times when we have ignored or forgotten you in the midst of our busy lives. We're sorry for the times when what we have thought or said or done has got in the way of your good purposes. We pray in this moment that you would enable us all to know your forgiveness the forgiveness that you freely offer us help us by your spirit to know that deep in our hearts so that we may offer it to others we open our lives to your goodness and love that your spirit may be at work in us. Speak to us today and transform us just a little bit more into the likeness of Christ. For in his name we pray and we join together in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Well, time for uh, family news now. Uh, one piece of family news that some of you may already know. Um, I'm here on my own today rather than leading with Gail because unfortunately uh, Gail has got COVID. Uh, and so she is uh, uh, recovering uh, at home uh, and uh, we send Gail our best wishes and, uh, uh, and our prayers uh, for Gail. Uh, any other news uh, that you'd like to share with us today? We went to the playhouse last night, the St. Abbott Tribune Band. It was really good. Uh huh. Excellent. Did you have a good sing along? And uh, uh, we, we think of uh, uh, those in our church family uh, not with us today, uh, those at home and those uh, elsewhere in the world, uh, in Nicaragua, I think of Margaret, and apparently there are uh, some spam emails that have been coming. Uh, from her, so so just be careful if you if you receive an email, uh, just just check. You think is this really uh, uh, from her? And uh, some of them you just need to uh, delete if they're saying something uh, seems out of character. Be on the uh, on the lookout for that. Okay, so today um, uh, we're going to be uh, uh, hearing um, a fairly long scripture reading after our next hymn, uh, a scripture reading that's familiar. Uh, and so, uh, as we prepare uh, to listen to that, uh, we come to Jesus. We come to listen. We come uh, to receive. To still our hearts before him. As we sing together, I heard the voice of Jesus say. <coughs>
listen for the voice of the Lord in Scripture as we hear our Bible reading. Jesus and the Samaritan woman. Jesus left Judea and started for Galilee again. This time he had to go through Samaria, and on his way he came to the sound of Sychar. It was near the field that Jacob had long ago given to his son Joseph. The well that Jacob, yes, the well that Jacob had dug was still there, and Jesus sat down beside it because he was tired from travelling. It was noon, and after Jesus' disciples had gone into town to buy some food, a Samaritan woman came to draw water from the well. Jesus asked her, Would you please give me a drink of water? You are a Jew, she replied, and I am a Samaritan woman. How could he ask me for a drink of water when Jews and Samaritans won't have anything to do with each other? Jesus answered, you don't know what God wants to give you, and you don't know who is asking you for a drink. If you did, you would ask me for the water that gives life. So, the woman said, you don't even have a bucket, and the well is deep. Where are you going to get this life-giving water? Our ancestor Jacob dug this well for us, and his family and animals got water from it. Are you greater than Jacob? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will get thirsty again, but no one who drinks the water I give will ever be thirsty again. The water I give will become in that person a flowing fountain that gives eternal life. The woman replied, Sir, please give me a drink of that water, then I won't get thirsty and have to come to this well again. Jesus told her, Go and bring your husband. The woman answered, I don't have a husband. That's right, Jesus replied. You're telling the truth. You don't have a husband. You have already been married five times, and the man you are now living with isn't your husband. The woman said, Sir, I can see that you are a prophet. My ancestors worshipped on this mountain. But you Jews say Jerusalem is the only place to worship. Jesus said to her, Believe me, the time is coming when you won't worship the Father, either on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans don't really know the one you worship. But we Jews do know the God we worship, and by using us, God will save the world. But a time is coming and it is already here. Even now, the true worshippers are being led by the Spirit to worship the Father according to the truth. These are the ones the Father is seeking to worship him. God is Spirit, and those who worship God must be led by the Spirit to worship him according to the truth. The woman said, I know that the Messiah will come. He is the one we call Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. I am that one, Jesus told her, and I am speaking to you now. The disciples returned about this time and were surprised to find Jesus talking with a woman. But none of them asked him what he wanted or why he was talking with her. The woman left her water jar and ran back into town, where she said to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. Could he be the Messiah? Everyone in town went out to see Jesus. While this was happening, Jesus' disciples were saying to him, Teacher, please eat something. But Jesus told them, I have food you don't know anything about. His disciples started asking each other, Has someone brought him something to eat? Jesus said, My food is to do what God wants. He is the one who sent me, and I must finish the work that he gave me to do. You may say there are still four months until harvest time, but I tell you to look, and you will see that the fields are ripe and ready to harvest. Even now, the harvest workers are receiving their reward by gathering a harvest that brings eternal life. 
then everyone who planted the seed and everyone who harvests the crop will celebrate together. So the saying proves too. Some plant the seed and others harvest the crop. I am sending you to harvest crops in fields where others have done all the hard work. A lot of Samaritans in that town put their faith in Jesus because the woman had said, this man told me everything I have ever done. They came and asked him to stay in their town. But he stayed on for two days. Many more Samaritans put their faith in Jesus because of what they heard him say. They told the woman, we no longer have faith in Jesus just because of what you told us. We have heard him ourselves and we are certain that he is the saviour of the world. Amen. For 10 years, my family lived in exile, on the wrong side of the Pennines. And we regularly made the journey home at weekends along the M62. And my favourite part of the journey was when we reached the border stone, with the picture of the white rose of God's own county of Yorkshire, and left behind the dark county of Lancashire. But the friendly rivalry between the folks of those two northern counties is nothing, nothing compared to the deep animosity and even a hatred between the peoples of Judea and Samaria. And in our gospel reading today, Jesus crosses the border, but he crosses the border in more ways than one. Jesus is deliberately crossing both geographical and religious and cultural boundaries in this encounter at the well in Samaria. Jesus was taking a risk by talking to this woman because he was doing something considered scandalous in the culture of his day. In just being with her alone, never mind striking up a conversation and asking her for a drink of water. Because firstly, she was a Samaritan and Jews at the time did not associate with Samaritans. And second, she was a woman. And it was scandalous to talk to a woman on her own. But Jesus is willing to cross and to ignore those boundaries, to ignore those societal expectations and those cultural taboos. And he talks to this Samaritan woman in exactly the same way that he spoke to his Galilean male disciples like Peter, James and John. In the same way that he spoke with the curious Judean Pharisee Nicodemus in the previous chapter. This long theological conversation is the conversation of a rabbi and a disciple. And that is exactly what John portrays this woman as being, an ideal disciple. But unfortunately that's not always how the church has described her. Now I must confess to my shame that in many of my previous sermons I have repeated that well-worn assumption that the reason she was at the well in the heat of the day on her own at noon was because she'd been shunned by the other women of her village and because she was a bit of a man-eater or a harlot or an adulteress who has worked her way through five husbands. And so here is a sinful woman who needs to repent. But if we actually read the text of the story, that's not what it says. That's not the story. It's a distortion by previous patriarchal generations of scholars that have ignored the culture and the text. And it's clouded 
the way that we see this woman and the way that we interpret this passage of scripture. Sin is not mentioned once in this passage. And since Jesus is not shy about confronting sin in John's Gospel, if this really was a story about a sinful woman needing forgiveness, we would expect to have some reference to that sin. And Jesus, at the very least, telling her to go and sin no more. But that's not there at all. This story is not about a sinful woman. That is simply something that has been assumed because of reading that she'd been married five times through the lens of our own culture. But it wasn't unusual for a woman to be married multiple times in that culture. A young woman would be married off at about the age of 15 or younger, often to a significantly older man. And therefore it was common for a woman to be widowed at a young age. And in a society that operated in terms of male-centered households, where women had no status, no security, no income of their own, she would need to remarry. The woman at the well might well have been widowed a few times. She might also have been divorced, although not by her own decision. It was only the men who had authority to divorce, and often for trivial or selfish reasons, leaving a woman simply discarded and needing to remarry again just to survive in that society. And now, after going through this five times, perhaps she's found a man that's offered her a place to stay in return for domestic duties, or some kind of arrangement that we might refer to as a common law marriage. So when Jesus says that he knows about her five marriages, I don't believe he's accusing her of a sinful life. He's simply saying that he knows what life has been like for her. That she may have suffered grief. She may have been discarded and hurt. But God cares and God knows. And the Messiah is here and calling her to be a disciple. And it's the fact that Jesus knows her story that convinces her that Jesus really is a prophet. Just like what happens in the encounter with Jesus and Nathaniel two chapters earlier. The Samaritan woman at the well is in fact portrayed by John as an exemplary disciple. Because she engages with everything that Jesus says. She asks thoughtful and intelligent questions. She moves on in her thinking and her understanding. She's thirsty for the good news that Jesus is bringing. And so Jesus is pleased to say to her, I am he. I am the one who is speaking to you now. I am the Christ. And just like Jesus, she is also brave enough to be prepared to cross cultural barriers. And to do this in broad daylight. And this, I believe, is the significance of this encounter with Jesus taking place at noon. Unlike Nicodemus, in the previous chapter who came to Jesus at night, under the cover of darkness, worried what his fellow Pharisees might think if it was reported that he'd been seen with this controversial rabbi called Jesus. 
The Samaritan woman could have refused to respond to the request of Jesus for a drink. She could have quietly and quickly drawn her water from the well and then returned to her village without taking the risk that someone might see her talking with this Jewish man. But she responds to Jesus in broad daylight, not hidden away at night. And then after her encounter with Jesus, that has transformed her and convinced her that this man really is the Messiah, she then courageously goes and shares the good news with the people of her village. And they listen. She is clearly someone who commands some respect among them. For they don't dismiss her or what she says. They listen. She is an unlikely choice. And the first readers of John's Gospel would have considered her an ultimate outsider. A Samaritan and a woman. And yet, the Gospel holds her up as an exemplary disciple and a courageous evangelist. And of course, another part of the message of this encounter beyond the borders of Judea with an unlikely outsider is to show that the living water of the gospel, the living water of the life and the love of Jesus is offered to all people. The living water of his grace was for the Samaritan woman and for the people of her foreign town and for everyone who experiences a life that has left them feeling empty and thirsty. Just like water is something that everyone needs, so everyone needs the living water Of the life and love of Jesus. And as Jesus offers this. To the Samaritan woman. And to her people. Not just. To his Judean disciples. Or just. To his own people. Jesus shows that his. Living water. Is offered. To all. Quick question for you. How much of the human body do you think is made up of water? Any ideas? 50%? Any advance on 50%? More than 50? 80%? It is 70%. Does that make 70? 72%. 72% on average. No wonder water is so important to us. And that we quickly get thirsty. Especially if we're working hard or on a journey or exercising. If we don't keep drinking, especially when we're being energetic, we get dehydrated. That's when the different organs in our body that are supposed to contain about 72% water in order to function properly have less water content and can't do their job properly. And when we get really thirsty it's our body's way of telling us I need more water. And when Jesus talks about offering us living water, part of what he's telling us is that in a similar way to our body giving us a thirst for water, so our spirit tells us that we are thirsty for something. 
We need something more. We need something deeper to give our lives fulfilment and meaning and hope and purpose. And until we discover that living water that Jesus gives, we can try and satisfy that deeper thirst with all kinds of things. With money and success or possessions and pleasure. And they might be okay for a while. But then we're thirsty again. But Jesus says to us, whoever drinks the water I will give will never thirst. We need that living water. But sometimes, in the midst of all that's going on in our lives, we don't realise just how thirsty we really are. When our daughter Sarah was 14 months old, she was quite ill with sickness and diarrhea. And afterwards, she just wouldn't eat or drink. We had the food and the drink there for her, but she just refused. She didn't realise how much her body needed the food and drink. She didn't seem to feel the thirst and ended up in hospital with dehydration. I had to put her on a drip to rehydrate her body. And then when her system kicked in, she then began to drink and drink and drink. I wonder if we sometimes end up being spiritually dehydrated. We don't realise just how much we need the living water that only Jesus can give. There is within each one of us a deeper kind of thirst that can only be satisfied by the Spirit of Jesus. Jesus says, to the Samaritan woman of the well. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Jesus gives us the living water of his spirit, of his life, and love and forgiveness and peace to those who ask him. So as we continue in worship, let's humbly come to Jesus, recognising how much we need to keep receiving that living wood, and ask him, and open our lives to receive. See the streams of living water springing from eternal love. Who can faint while such a river ever flows their thirst to assuage? We sing together. Glorious saints of thee are sung.
Just before we come to our prayers, I just wanted to, to read to you uh, a letter uh, that's been written by uh, leaders of the uh, uh, Methodist, Baptist and United Reformed churches uh, in response uh, to the government's uh, so-called illegal migration bill that's been causing quite a stir this week. Uh, I think it's important that we, uh, as churches, uh, respond to this. So this is uh, uh, the content of that letter that's been signed uh, by these folks and also uh, by thousands uh, of Christian leaders around the country. We are appalled by the proposals in the government's illegal migration bill to detain and punish and reject thousands of people seeking safety. They are completely incompatible with our Christian conviction that all human beings are made in the image of God and are therefore inherently worth, worthy of treatment which honours their dignity. Instead of dignity, these plans will foster discrimination and distrust and cause immeasurable harm to people already made vulnerable by conflict and persecution. If ever there was a contemporary example of ignoring our neighbour and walking by on the other side, this is it. When two in every three people who cross the channel to seek sanctuary in the UK are granted asylum following rigorous checks, it seems unthinkable to reject them before they have even had a chance to have their claim for asylum heard. Many people fleeing war and persecution in countries such as Iraq, Iran, Syria, Eritrea and Sudan have been left with no safe and accessible routes to claim asylum in the UK. Forcing people to make difficult and dangerous decisions. The UK falls far behind our global neighbours in welcoming people seeking sanctuary in our communities. And yet these plans essentially put a ban on claiming asylum and reject the UK's responsibility to play our part in responding to global inequalities and conflict. We all agree that we cannot continue to see thousands of people risk their lives to reach safety in the UK. But the solution cannot be deterrence and punishment. As Christians we believe that we should be among the first to welcome the stranger with open arms. We urge the government to withdraw this legislation, to honour our moral and international obligations and to behave with compassion and fairness by establishing safe and accessible routes to enable the UK to play its part in welcoming people in need of safety. That's signed by the URC uh, moderator, uh, the General Secretary of the Baptist Union and the President and the Vice President of the Methodist Conference. Uh, and Jay Pitt have been uh, publicising uh, that letter uh, and also encouraging people uh, to write to their MPs in response to it. Uh, so if that's something that any of you uh, feel prompted to do, uh, I've got a few copies uh, of the letter and then on the other side uh, some points that you might want to include in a letter to your MP if you wish to do so. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give thanks that in Jesus, you are the one who crosses boundaries, offering love and grace to all people, considering all people to be part of one family, all made in the image and likeness of God and precious to you. 
so rejoicing in your blessings and trusting in your loving care for all we bring you our prayers for the world we pray for the created world for those who rebuild where things have been destroyed for those who fight hunger, poverty and disease for those who have power to bring change for the better and to renew hope in the life of our world may your kingdom come and we pray for our country for those in leadership who frame our laws and shape our common life and we pray that our laws may be set with a sense of justice and righteousness and compassion and not out of populism and fear and division we pray for those who keep the peace and administer justice for those who teach and those who heal and for all who serve our community in the life of our land may your kingdom come we pray for people who are in need those for whom life is a bitter struggle those whose lives are clouded by death or loss by pain or disability by discouragement or fear by shame or rejection in the lives of those in need may your kingdom come and we pray for those in the circle of friendship and love around us for children and parents, sisters and brothers, friends and neighbours, and for those who are especially in our thoughts today. In the lives of those we love, may your kingdom. And we pray for the church and its worship and mission and its learning and caring and its serving of the community and in the sharing of the gospel in the world, in this land and in this community, in the life of your church, may your kingdom come. Eternal God, hear these our prayers, the spoken and the silent, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We worship God as we offer our gifts. The offering will now be. Gracious God, everything that we have and everything we are is a gift from you. And so we offer what is yours. These gifts and our lives in the service of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So, as God's family, we gather around this table. As sisters and brothers in Christ. And we celebrate our oneness. In Christ, God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, 
whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through his blood which was shed on the cross. The peace of the Lord be always with you. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Blessing and praise belong to you, gracious and eternal God. Through your living word, you created all things. The majesty of the heavens and the glory of the earth. In your wisdom and goodness, you have made all people in your image and likeness. Therefore, with saints and angels and with all creation, we lift up our voices to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the heart. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious God, we give you thanks and praise. That in the fullness of time, you gave your only son to share our human nature. And to be tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. To set his face resolutely towards Jerusalem. And to be lifted high upon a cross. That he might draw all creation to himself. When the hour of his glory came. And loving his own to the end. He sat with them at supper took bread and after giving thanks to you he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take eat this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me in the same way he took the cup after supper saying, drink from this all of you this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this whenever you drink in remembrance of me. Dying, Dying you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Lord Jesus, come in glory. In obedience to his command, we recall his suffering and death, his resurrection and ascension, and we look for his coming in glory. Send your Holy Spirit, that these gifts of bread and wine may be for us the body and blood of Christ. In union with Christ's offering for us, we offer ourselves as a holy and living sacrifice. <coughs> Unite us in love and peace with all your people, until with the whole company of heaven we are brought into the presence of of your eternal glory through Jesus Christ our Lord through him with him and in him in the unity of the Holy Spirit all honor and glory are yours almighty Father now and forever The bread we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. Christ is the bread of life. The cup we take is a sharing in the blood of Christ. Christ is the true one. We say it again. Lord, we come to your table. Trusting in your mercy and not in any goodness of our own. 
We are not worthy even to gather up the crumbs under your table. But it is your nature always to have mercy. And on that we depend. So feed us with the body and blood of Jesus Christ, your Son, that we may forever live in him and he in us. Amen. All are invited to receive the bread and the wine, including those of you who might be watching uh, later in the day. Uh, and if you've not yet done so and you're at home, you might like to get yourself uh, a bit of bread and some juice so that you can join with us in this community. Come to this sacred table, not because you must, but because you may. Come not to declare that you are righteous, but that you desire to be true disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ. Come, not because you are strong, but because you are weak. Not because you have any claim on heaven's rewards, but because in your frailty and sin, you stand in constant need of heaven's mercy and help. So draw near with faith. is all understanding and sustain you on your journey with his living breath. Amen. We say it again. Gracious God, we thank you that you have nourished us with the bread of life and the cup of salvation. May we who have received this sacrament be strengthened in your service. We who have sung your praises live in your glory. And we who have known the greatness of your love see you face to face in your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our final hymn, Let Us Build a House. Well, love can dwell.
God of all grace, who has called us to eternal glory in Christ, make us perfect, confirming and strengthening us, and to him be the power for ever and ever. Amen. The almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless us and keep us, now and always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.